Hello, welcome to Uncut, where I talk about the things that I do while not actually doing it. This echoes a lot. Wait. For some reason, I thought I could wing this completely and didn't need any notes. The fact that I'm standing in this spot right now with a pen in my hand answers that very question. I made the notes. Classic cars are unreliable but that's okay. What did people do in 1986? They drove their 1986 Porsche 924 S wherever they wanted to go because it just existed. Same as in 1968, in 1954, and in 1997. The car that's new is the car you trust the most. Now, obviously, I know I picked a manufacturer that is not known for unreliability and different mechanical constructions from different manufacturers over time have a different tendency of failure. But the point here still stands. While these cars were new, they were used and abused to the fullest. And I think you realize where this is going. 30 plus years, or sometimes way more than that, have passed since 1986. So what has happened with all the rubber, with all the fuel lines, with all the injectors, the mechanical components of any kind, they wear out, they get old, and they fail. And that's why classic cars are unreliable. I usually, just for, because I like it, I put these up and I think I'm gonna do it again. But I'm not going to re-record that, because I liked it. So the point here is, it's no wonder those cars are unreliable. Because they've already been used and abused within what they were initially designed to do. You can't expect a car after 30 years to just perform as it, you know, just rolled off the showroom floor. And sure, an engine can go a million miles depending on its construction. And yes, a controller arm bushing rarely, if ever, wears out all the way. But if you take all those little decreases in, in performance and in durability and in strength overall, it adds up. And then more and more failure points start appearing and less and less things work over time. Now wait. I'm not qualified to say this. I have no formal education in any automotive field or any field <laughs> at all, actually. And why would I place such bold claims? Now, the reality is this is my third ever 924. And my first two and most of the life of this during my daily driver period, I had countless issues. Like something would fail all the time. Something would be just about not right or just on the verge of going out. Car wouldn't start hot, car wouldn't start cold, brakes would go through the floor, no power, complete loss of oil pressure, the whole thing. But ultimately this car in its final state, more or less as it sits here, went to the Nord Cup and back. 8,000 plus kilometers without a single mechanical issue that would leave us stranded for good. Granted, we ripped the timing belt, but I'll touch on that in a second. And then this, this 86 24S, just completed 8,400 kilometers down to Portugal and back. And I didn't hold back. And I had, didn't, there wasn't a single mechanical issue to even speak of. Refilling coolant in this particular instance doesn't really count. Now, if I say classic cars are not reliable, how come I trust either one of these 
to get me to wherever I want to go. And granted, there is a bit of irony involved because this is on a trolley and this is currently out of commission for a lot of reasons that I'm going to touch on in later episodes. The point is you make them reliable again. You go through and you fix the mechanical, electronical, hydraulic, whatever systems you have on the car to get you from A to B, to get you to where you want to go. And there's a whole, like, there's a massive difference between a failing windshield wiper, which also can leave you stranded, and an engine going nuke. This, you, you, you have to evaluate where the risks are for your given journey. But in my particular case, if it's 30 years old and it's, there's no point in keeping it. I'm not fine with it was fine because that's just not the way it works. It might work if you use it occasionally and you're fine with it and you can tow it back to your house. But I'm in Portugal, I'm at the Nord Cup. I don't have time to worry about something that I should have worried about at home. Did I get that across? I hope that was good. So obviously in, in that whole conversation, there's a difference between repairing and restoring. To me, repairing is making something as functional as it was, and restoring is making something as functional as it was, and also looking like it's either new or as close to as new condition as possible. Because sometimes you can't replace, you can't repair, and you can't, you can't feasibly restore. Everybody who knows classic car restoration knows the point. Certain parts you have to refurbish, but you're still not happy with the end result. And for some reason, either time, money, or availability, you still have to put it back. But that's kind of the gist of it. And this car was fully repaired, and this car was fully restored. So your car is now reliable. Or is it? The thing is, every mechanical system can fail. A fly. Every mechanical system can fail, but it's up to you to spot which it is and when it happens. Because today's cars, you're not really supposed to do that. They have a light or a screen or a big screen that tells you, stop immediately, this and that and whatnot. And maybe you have an app with a thing and then you can, it tells you what's wrong with it. Now, this is fully mechanical. This is still fairly mechanical. And they have some lights, but they don't tell you the really important stuff. Because this engine is about to go out and this differential bearing, I think, is already done. And no one prepared us for the ripping timing belt in the 78. But we obviously knew what we were looking for. And every time you hear a noise and you hear a sound and something changes, it's up to you. You have to learn what your car can tell you. And if you're doing this for a while, every classic car is more or less the same in certain ways. Of course, there's some differences in speciality areas of each and every individual car is like, you can't, you can't know it all, but you know when something's wrong and when something is about to go wrong, you start to be very cautious and very careful and then you can avoid it. I think I could rock this engine for another three, four, five thousand kilometers and nothing would ever happen. But if I would rev it out once, like brutally all the way hardcore, I think I would just kill it like that. So I'm sorry. It's not only the car, you're also part of it. Calculate your risks. You see, I knew that the engine in my white car was about to go out before I left on the trip. And I knew that uh, if I am not careful and I don't pay attention to all the warning signs, it might kill itself in the least favorable moment because that's what's you know, happening. 
And obviously, in, an, in, a, in any normal instance, a ripped timing belt would mean the complete end of the trip and likely the end of the engine. But that was also a calculated risk on this car. Because I knew this engine is freely spinning, which is part of the reason why it makes no power whatsoever. But if the timing belt rips, nothing happens. So the reason it's such a non-event is we had a spare timing belt. And if you know how to change it, it's done within 25, 30 minutes, and you are on your way. Nothing has ever changed. It's like nothing has ever happened. And with the white car, I knew that I, I didn't want it to happen, but it's very unlikely to happen if I'm careful. And that is also part of it. Look, you have to expect the worst possible dilemma, the worst possible thing that could happen to your car in advance. What do you do if you're really far away and your engine breaks? What do you do? Do you have a backup plan or do you have mentally prepared yourself for that situation? And in reality, I didn't ever expect the black car to make the trip to the North Cup and back. I mentally prepared myself for wrapping it around a tree, flying home and calling it a journey. But it's still here. All I'm saying here is expect the worst. No matter what vehicle you choose, by the way, even if it's a modern car. The difference is if you built your classic car yourself or you know it very well, you can calculate the risks a lot more reasonably and you usually work out backup plans and you know what parts to bring and how to you know evaluate a situation. Hats off to people like Philippe Delaporte who uh, drove around the world in a Porsche 928 because um, I know Porsche 928s by now and uh, yeah uh. the reality is you just go and do and you learn along the way don't expect them to perform like they were new, because they are not. They have lived a life. Most classic cars have lived a very arduous and very adventurous life. And even those that, that lived a very boring life, they're still old. Things will still break. But if you don't do it, you'll never learn and you'll never get better at judging you know, judging the risks and, and assessing what's going to happen. And there's, we were in Sweden on that morning. It had minus 20 some degrees. It was bloody f cold. And we went on that frozen ice track during the uh, winter rally that we did. And during that ice event, I really took it to the max. Five and a half thousand RPM, which is exactly where you should shift in that because above that nothing happens. And I had the fun of my life. And sure, that's the worst thing you can do if you still have 6,000-ish kilometers to do. But if you build it right, and if you assess it right, it'll last. And there's very few moments that compare to being in a place where a car is not supposed to be and enjoying it to the fullest. That very quiet tick, 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 tick sound that you hear when you're out in the open on Lofoten Islands, in winter or on a hill in Portugal with a car that shouldn't really have made it, that's not the sensible choice that people tell you not to take, is the greatest feeling in the world. That's pretty much the reason why I do this. Sure, a modern car would have made it, but what's, like, where's the fun in that? And I've, I look to people that drive from Africa to London in an old Alpha. And I look to the old Land Rover stories, where it's the first car that's ever been to a place. And it's like, sure, it wasn't meant to go there. And back then it might have been new, but an old Land Rover was always an old Land Rover. And it made it. And it can still be done. And you can still have a good time. And no, you're not going to constantly break down if you prepare right. You are as much part of the journey as the car is. And that is my wisdom for today. So did this make any sense? You tell me. I'm not a know-it-all, 
but I've made this trip without any major hiccups. I made this trip without any major hiccups. And truth be told, our Land Rover never let... And truth be told, our Land Rover never left us truly stranded within the whole expedition trip living situation that we did. So I think I'm kind of in a good position to tell you if you want to make it and you take care of it, you're probably going to make it. I don't think there's a single car that was ever built that I wouldn't after going through it that I wouldn't trust to get me where I want to go. I know people that have done peaking to Paris in a 1928 Bentley. I am softcore here. I'm really not, I'm really not that great of an expedition. Uh, I'm not. By the way, a 1928 Bentley has one of the greatest exhaust notes known to man. And as is the tradition, which is funny to say, given this is episode two of Uncut, I am uh, going to show you a bit of the... Oop, so why is this thing even in here? Because it's not supposed to be. And why is it this clean? Because it's not supposed to be, because it's my daily. Well, the problem is, it's no longer driving. As it seems, I'm going to show you that, this part has failed. Now that is a differential, and this entire schmoozles here is a gearbox. Now it is not the gearbox that is currently in this car because that's still in it. The problem is, it's making horrible noises, that thing, and I don't think I can fix it right now. So, as I showed you last week, there is an engine block, and now there is a transmission, and this thing is unfortunately out of commission. <sighs> but I got new cool parts. See this? This is a flywheel. What makes this flywheel cool is I took 1.7 kilograms off of it. And that's enough of a spoiler. Out. I know it's ironic. This entire thing is ironic because this car has a broken gearbox and this car is on a, on a trolley. So nothing here makes sense. And I'm a complete, uh, I'm a complete idiot. Yeah. But you watched it all the way to here, so it's, it's kind of your fault too.